Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to Swayam Prabha. This is Dr. Sumiti Ahuja and I am Assistant Professor from Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. And in our fourth session, uh, which is titled Consideration, we will be covering the following topics. Definition of consideration under the Indian Contract Act 1872, types of consideration, lawful consideration, exceptions to the requirement of consideration for formation of a valid contract, the, con the doctrines of privity of consideration, the doctrine of privity of contract and the exceptions pertaining to it. Before I start with this fourth session, I would like to highlight that this topic, the definition of the topic of consideration which is given under section 2 clause D of the Indian Contract Act is one of the lengthiest definitions in the act and there are various essential components because whenever I teach my students in the class, first thing I tell them when we start with the definition of consideration is that we have to dissect the definition because we have to understand if you will have a look at the definition which we will be going through at a later stage of the session, you will understand that there is just one line, one sentence which is falling in four lines. So, it is only comma, comma, comma which is uh, distributing that provision. So, we have to understand that provision part by part. So, may to in order to make it easy for you, I have divided into various parts and we will be taking them up one by one. To start with the general meaning of the term consideration, as you can see on the screen, I have mentioned that it is something in return, something in return which in as a Latin phrase is recognized as quid pro quo, that is when you are returning uh, favor to someone, right. So, in the first session of this course on law of contracts, I had highlighted that consideration if we talk in layman language is like buying someone's promise. So, you are giving something in return to a person who is making a promise to you. So, consideration is a legal term that refers to the benefits that each contracting party gains. This is typically payment in exchange for products or services, you can say goods or services. Now, consideration does not have to be in form of money. It can be anything of value that you receive as part of a contract such as any equipment, goods or any or, or some work. So, through this point I have tried to highlight that whenever we refer to this term consideration and we say that we are buying someone's promise, it need not necessarily be that you are paying someone something, some amount of money because some that other person has promised you something. This money, this consideration can be in form of money it can be in form of goods or services also. Like in one of the previous sessions, I had told you this thing that say for example, a person comes to you and uh, makes an offer to you that uh, say he is willing to sell his car to you for say 2 lakhs, right. So, his, he is willing to sell his car to you. So, from his side, the consideration would be the car which he will be selling to you. And Say for example, you accept his offer, that is you are uh, interested in say purchasing his car and uh, you are ready to pay 2 lakhs to him. So, from your side the consideration is in form of money. So, it can be this way also that one is providing you goods or services and the other one re in return of it is providing you money. So, consideration can be money, it can be in kind also, it can be some goods or services as well. Now, you can see that uh, I have highlighted here, consideration has to be of some value in the eyes of law, that is it has to be real and not illusory. 
So, promising someone that I will go, uh, I will go to the sky, I will get moon, stars for you, that is not real, that is illusory, that is something which is not possible, it is an impossible thing, right. And therefore, it does not have any value in the eyes of law, right. Now, adequacy of consideration is not a necessary legal requirement. We will be coming across this part when we would be going through the legal provisions also, but at this juncture, I would like to highlight a point that is, it is not necessary. See, if I have a property which is worth uh, uh, crores, it is not necessary that when I, when I have to sell that property, I need to sell that property uh, in crores only. If I have to leave the country, if I am shifting base, I am in a hurry and I wish to dispose of the property, it is up to me. I may end up selling it uh, in say crores of uh, property, I may end up selling it in lakhs, right. So that is up to me because as per the Indian Contract Act, consideration need not necessarily be adequate, it can be inadequate also. Now I have highlighted before we move on to the definition of consideration as given under the Indian law of contracts. I have highlighted this definition by Pollock, who happens to be a jurist also. So, according to Pollock, consideration is the price for which the promise of other is bought and promise thus given for value is enforceable. So, in our uh, earlier sessions, we have discussed what is the meaning of the term enforceable. If I say my uh, right has been infringed and legal right is enforceable in court of law. Enforceable means I have a remedy for which legal remedy in existence and I can go to the court of law and put my claim and uh, claim the remedy. So, it is enforceable that means remedy exists in the eyes of law. Remember when we had discussed uh, the basic definitions, interpretation clause, definition clause also as we call it. We, I had told you when we were distinguishing uh, between the terms void agreement and contract, the point of very small point of difference between both was that an agreement which is enforceable by law is a contract and an agreement which is not enforceable by law is a void agreement, right. Now moving on to the definition of the concept or of the term consideration as is given under the Indian Contract Act 1872. I would like to read this definition for you and then we will see how we can divide this definition into various parts and understand it. It says, when at the desire of the promiser, the promisee or any other person has done or abstained from doing, does or abstains from doing or promises to do or abstain from doing. This is point number 3. Something, so such act or abstinence or promise is called a consideration for the promise. Now you can see for yourself on the screen that I have marked this definition or I have divided this definition into three points, three parts which are visible on your screen. First is at the desire of the promiser, that means consideration always is always given at the desire of the promiser, that means only when the promiser is also ready. And the next is promisee or any other person. Now, this is a very interesting concept, we will be uh, discussing it in detail at a later stage. What we are trying to say here that see, till now we have just understood that okay fine, there is a contract in a contract, we need two parties, those two parties are uh, should be competent, legally competent to enter into such contract, it should be out of free consent and uh, there should be lawful consideration. So, our focus has always been on these two parties only of uh, whom we are referring to. One makes the offer, other gives the acceptance to that offer, right. But if you see this definition here, you will see it is saying that at the desire of the promiser, promisee or any other person can also provide consideration. That means a person who is a stranger, 
who is not party to that contract can also provide consideration in a contract. We will be discussing it in detail, but for right now, for the time being, just understand this thing that if two parties are entering into a contract, a third person can provide for consideration on behalf of either of the parties. That is acceptable under Indian law and that is what is given under the definition also. Now, the third point which you can see on your screens which I have highlighted is that uh, has done or abstained from doing, does or abstain from doing or uh, promises to do or abstain from doing. This does or this uh, doing something or abstaining to do something is, some, is something which we have already discussed. I had told you when I say that uh, promises to do something, that means you are promising that you will be doing a positive act, you will be doing something, doing an act for someone. And when we say abstinence, that means you are promising that you would not act in a particular manner, omission, right. So, we also call it as a negative act. Now, uh, when we talk about these three, this uh, third point here and you can see it says the tenses are changing. It says has done or abstained from doing, does or abstains from doing or promises to do or to abstain from doing something. So, these changing tenses are highlighting the different types of consideration. When we say has done or abstained from doing that means is already done. So, this is what we call as past consideration, right. And then you can see it says does or abstains from doing. We are referring to present tense here, right. So, that is present consideration. Third is promises to do or to abstain from doing something. Now, promises to do that means you are promising that you will be acting in a particular manner in future. That is why it is the third type of consideration which we were referring to. So, that is future consideration, right. I have slightly, I have uh, tried to elaborate these uh, three concepts, these three types of consideration. We will discuss them along with examples also. So, past consideration as I said, it has already been done, it has already happened. So, it says a promise or conduct which is made or carried out prior to the formation of a contract. So, you had say for example, uh, you ask someone, say your bike uh, goes, uh, the, the petrol gets finished in your bike, right? And you are uh, not having money also. This is a very common example which we generally give. So, money is not there, but you do go to the petrol pump and request that person that see, please uh, uh, <laughs> fill petrol in this. Maybe that person is known to you or ends up trusting you. So, you uh, tell that person that see I am not carrying mon any money right now, but please uh, fill petrol in my bike and I will be and uh, please fill petrol in my bike, right. And I will pay you in the next visit, right or I will pay you at a later stage, whatever. Now then later on you go specifically and you make that payment to that person for filling petrol in your uh, bike. Now you are giving that money to that person at a later stage for which the consideration has already been provided by him to you. That is he had at your desire, at your request, he had filled petrol in your bike, but you acted at a later stage and you paid, uh, paid to him later on, right. So, past already done. Then present consideration as I had said, if the promise and consideration take place simultaneously then it is present or what we also call as executed consideration. It is the most simplest uh, form of consideration to understand. So, present consideration is you just go to a normal local grocery shop and you just tell that person that uh, find my toothpaste, uh, I, I just want to buy this uh, one uh, pack of Colgate toothpaste, right. The person gives that toothpaste to you and uh, he tells you the amount and you pay that person there and then. So, this is a simultaneous act, you asking for, you making the offer, the other person accepting the offer, the other person giving you the thing which you had asked for and you give making the payment there and then. So, these things promise the consideration, they are going on simultaneously. Now, comes the third type of consideration which we call as future consideration. 
Now, say for example, let us talk about this uh, say uh, a lease agreement, right. So, the contract has been entered into between the two parties, the one who is giving his property on lease and the other person who is taking that property on lease. And now, the terms of the contract have already been uh, uh, written, they are already there in written and yes, the this uh, it, it is agreed between the two parties that the tenant would be taking that property from you from say the starting of next month say like after 20 days right and the day he takes the possession that is after 20 days that is the time when before taking the possession he will be giving you the uh, advance rent, the security deposit etc etc. So, what, what I am trying to highlight is that you are entering into that contract at a stage right now and wherein the parties and the parties are promising to each other to act in future. That is, I promise that I will be, I will be giving my property to you for rent at uh, after 20, after a period of say 20 days and the other one is promising to you that he will take the possession of the property and before he takes the possession will be paying you the rent, the advance rent for say 2-3 months and the security deposit. So, this, these are the two promises which they are making to each other, the reciprocal promises, promise and return of promise, which they are saying that they will be fulfilling at a future, uh, future period, right. So, that is the future consideration, where I am promising that I will be, I will be acting in a particular manner at a future time. Now, comes the concept of privity of consideration. Remember, when we were, uh, when I just referred to this definition of consideration under section 2D of the Indian Contract Act, it stated when at the desire of the promiser, the promisee or any other person, right. So, the concept of privity, privity means that if there is, if the thing is between two people, no third person can intervene. So, the two parties are privy to it, there is no involvement of third person. But our law says that uh, at the desire of the promiser, promise or any other person can provide for consideration. So, do we follow privity of consideration in India? No, we do not. Because and this is something which is written in our law only that we do not follow privity of consideration and consideration can be provided by any third person also who is a stranger, uh, who is a stranger to the contract. Now, but yes, before I uh, give you the facts of this case law, which I have mentioned on uh, the in the slide briefly, just let me tell you a point of distinction between the Indian law and the English law here. I just mentioned that in India, we do not follow the doctrine of privity of consideration, right. That means third person can also, stranger to contract can also provide <coughs> consideration. But in English law, privity of consideration is there or if I may say doctrine of privity of consideration is followed in English law. That means only the two parties who are entering into contract can provide for consideration, no third person can intervene, right. Now, coming briefly to the facts of uh, this case, Venkat Chinnaya Rao versus Venkat Ramaya Garu, which is popularly known as, as I am writing on the screen. Chinnaya versus Ramaya. That is also a way of uh, uh, writing this case because you will see this reference in many textbooks or many uh, sources that it says Chinnaya versus Ramaya, but it is the same case law, right. Now, what happened in Chinnaya versus Ramaya, if I may explain to you briefly. So, there was this lady who owned certain uh, properties and she annually used to give some amount of money to her sibling and she used to do that every year, annual uh, payment, right, annuity. Now, she entered into a contract with her daughter, right, with her daughter wherein the lady that is the owner of the property, the old lady, she promised, she made a promise to her daughter that she will be transferring the title over that properties to her daughter. Now, provided that this, the daughter of hers was to fulfill one 
uh, had to make one promise from her side also in return. So, that promise was that she agrees that once she gets the uh, title over that property, those properties uh, become hers, she will continue to give that to make that payment to give that annuity to the sibling of her mother like her mother used to do earlier. Fine, so the daughter agreed to it. They entered into a contract and the daughter clearly uh, uh, promised or agreed that she will be uh, paying this annuity amount, right. In fact, she gave it in written to the sibling of her mother that I agree that I will be, I agree to pay this much amount of money uh, on annual basis, right. Now, she committed a default. Once she got the uh, title over that property, once that contract came into picture, she defaulted in making that annual, uh, annual payment, right. Now, the question arises and uh, the sibling, say for example, the sibling here of the mother sues the daughter, right, sues the daughter. Now, she says that how can you sue me? Because there was no contract between you and me. The contract was between my mother and me. My mother promised that she will be transferring the property in my name if I agree that I will uh, make that payment to you. But I defaulted in that payment. So, if there is someone who has some locus or who can approach the court to claim relief in this case is the mother. Because if I did not fulfill the condition, there was a breach of contract, but contract was with mother, not with you. So, you cannot, right, because it was a one-sided promise. There is this concept or if I may say there is this term, nudum pactum. Nudum pactum means a bare promise. That is, it is one-sided promise. You are making a promise to someone but the other party is not making any promise in return. So, you are promising that you will do something or you will act in a particular manner, but in return of your promise, the other party is not promising anything. So, it is a bare promise, it does not become a contract, right. Now, so yes, uh, continuing with Chinaya uh, versus Ramaya's case, I just told you that the daughter stated that I did not enter into any contract with you, how can I, how can you sue me? I am not under any obligation to pay that amount to you, right? And I have not committed any, uh, uh, anything wrong. Now, the question arose, is it whether it was correct, whether that sibling of her mother was in a position to sue this, uh, the daughter here? So, consideration for the promise can be provided by other party also, can be provided by the third person also. So, the daughter gave it in written or made a promise to the sibling that she will be making that payment. From the side of the sibling, the consideration was provided by the mother, that is she provided the property, she transferred the property in the daughter's name. So, it was held that in India, the privity of consideration doctrine is not followed and even a third person can provide for consideration, which means that the contract between the mother, the daughter and the siblings of the mother was very well valid contract, wherein from the side of the mother's sibling, mother had provided the consideration. Now, coming to this concept of privity of contract. So, now we understood what privity is, that is no third person or no stranger can intervene, right. Now, so if we say that privity of consideration means that the third party cannot provide for consideration, so what do we mean by privity of contract? Privity of contract means no third party to that contract, that is no outsider, no stranger to the contract can sue if breach of contract is committed by either of the party, right. So, no stranger can provide for consideration is what we mean by privity of consideration. And when we say privity of contract, we mean that no stranger can sue if the contract has been breached, right. So, that is what privity of contract is. Now, regarding uh, the doctrine of privity of consideration, we just realized that privity of uh, consideration is not followed in India. 
and that is clearly reflecting from the definition under section 2 D, 2 clause D. But do we have doctrine of privity of contract in existence in India? The answer is yes. But at the same time, we need to understand that there are too many exceptions in existence to this doctrine. In fact, if you will do your uh, internet surfing, you will try to read about many, try to read about articles in the area of privity of contract, scholarly articles, not blogs and saying generally, I mean scholarly articles, you will also see that people have reached to this conclusion that this doctrine of privity of contract has been diluted so much because of these, uh, because of too many exceptions that it seems it is better to do away with this doctrine, right. That was only to uh, add to your knowledge. Now, let us see what the, what is there on the screen. It says, stranger to a contract cannot sue when breach of contract takes place. This is what privity of contract is. We follow the doctrine of breach of contract in Indian law, but with exceptions which allows a third party to sue in certain circumstances that is when any of those exceptions is in existence or the situation uh, related to any of those exceptions is in existence then at that time or then during those times even a third person can sue in case of breach of contract. Now the various exceptions which you will see you will find in many textbooks and many articles is I mean are trust, family settlement, here trust we do not mean trust, trust means a fiduciary relationship trusting someone, here we are talking about the relationship of a trustee and beneficiary, right. So trust, then it comes, then the second is family settlement, then it is assignment of a contract, then it is acknowledgement or estoppel, covenant running with the land. Right. So, these are few exceptions. Now, trust as I said means the relationship of a trust and benefit, trustee and a beneficiary. So, trustee is the sum, trustee say for example is someone who is holding a particular property on behalf of the beneficiary say for example because ben beneficiary is a minor and minor cannot, uh, minor does not have those uh, rights. He cannot enter into a valid contract with anybody in relation to that property, right. So, a trustee is appointed and the trustee takes care of that property till the time the beneficiary comes of age and is able to uh, take the title over the property and discharge that title also in the manner in which he or she likes, right. Now, family settlement is also something that it, it, it is an exception. If two members of a family have reached into a, a contract have made certain agreement, have entered into a contract, but that contract is in relation to or involves or it is dealing with a third person, third member of that family, then that third member of the family has a right to sue in case of breach. Then assignment of a contract, that is assigning of rights under a contract, acknowledgement, estoppel, right covenant running with the land, all these are also exceptions. But here at this stage, I would like to uh, tell you about this judgment of Nawab Khwaja Muhammad Khan versus Nawab Husseini Begum. You will see that in most of the cases wherein uh, we say ex this, is a, this is a case related to or this is a situation related to uh, exception to privity of contract, you will find that mostly the situations or the incidents are dealing with a beneficiary whose rights have been uh, affected, whose interest has been affected and who is allowed to sue in case of breach of contract, right. Mostly you will find cases related to trustee or uh, tr trustee beneficiary, right. So, third party benefiting out of that contract or you can say in whose favour that contract was entered into. Now, in Nawab Khwaja Muhammad Khan's judgment also, uh, the husband and so it, this case basically has say four, uh, if I may say four characters. Contract was entered into between the father and father-in-law of this uh, lady here, Nawab Husseini Begum. Now uh, and at that time when this contract was entered into, this lady Husseini Begum and her uh, would-be husband, they were minors. So on their behalf, 
their respective fathers had entered into a contract and in that contract the father in law of this girl had promised he had made a promise that after uh, after the marriage of you can say from the date of the marriage he promised to pay uh, some amount of money to his daughter in law as beetle leaf expenses beetle leaf expenses now beetle leaf expenses here we do not mean any kind of leaf we are trying to say this is a concept known as kharch e pandan which means that uh, this amount uh, would be given to this uh, lady and she can use utilize that money in any manner she wants to right it was her money now so under that contract the father in law had made that promise uh, that uh, if this marriage takes will take place then he promises that uh, if this lady marries uh, her son if this girl not lady she was a minor at that time if this girl marries uh, his son she he would be paying her a particular amount of money as beetle leaf expenses since uh, or from the date of marriage onwards right now they were minors when they were slightly grown up that is when she started living with her husband she lived with her husband for some time and then she again came back to her own home the father in law stopped giving that particular amount of money or the beetle leaf expenses to the daughter in law and state and uh, basically he refused he said that she had left the household and she is not having any right over this money anymore right now this daughter in law aggrieved by this action by this act of her father in law she approached the court now herein see the contract was made between the father of the girl and father in law of the girl but it was who was benefiting out of it in the sense the monetary benefit here was uh, that was being uh, given to the daughter in law now it and uh, here the daughter in law who was the beneficiary she is filing a suit against the father in law that is whatever arrears are there whatever money he had promised he should give that right because he had stated that see you uh, i had i mean i i was under obligation to make that payment till the time you were in our household in your matrimonial household you were entitled to that money now you have decided to stay away from my husband uh, my uh, son and you have deserted your husband so you do not have any claim over this money but the court stated and in fact you do not have the right to sue because i did not i did not enter into any contract with you court held that she being the beneficiary of that contract which was entered between the two fathers she was she being the beneficiary if the father in law or if one of the parties committed a default she had the right to sue the defaulting party and get her claim get her remedy right so that is what the court held in fact in this case there were certain situations but finally the court held this thing that she had the right to claim that particular amount now one most important element of a valid contract or essential of a valid contract which is referred under which is expressly stated under section 10 of the indian contract act is requirement of lawful consideration yes consideration has to be there yes consideration has to be generally has to be there from both the sides both the parties and uh, consideration has to be of some value in the eyes of law it need not be adequate but what we are emphasizing upon here right now is the lawfulness of consideration right so let's see what the def what the uh, what section 23 of the indian contract act states in relation to lawful consideration it says what considerations and objects are lawful and what not so although it is talking about what do we mean by lawful consideration but you will see that it is worded in a worded in a negative manner if i may say it is not saying that this particular thing is defined as or it includes this 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 thing it says whatever will fall under any of the categories stated under section 23 will not amount to lawful consideration 
let's see what those categories are so the provision goes on to read the consideration or object of an agreement is lawful unless that's why i said a negatively worded definition it is forbidden by law that is the law is stopping you from acting in a particular manner remember in our first session twice i had given you the example of a sharp shooter who is paid by a particular person uh, one of the, the the other party to kill someone right so we have previously which was indian penal code a uh, indian penal code 1860 and now we have uh, a different act which came in 2023 now which according to which the act of killing someone murdering someone committing culpable homicide amounting to murder not amounting to murder is an offence so that means it is forbidden by law the law is asking you not to act in a particular manner right so if you are promising someone that okay i will go and shoot the other person that pro that consideration from your side is not lawful in fact the object of that so called contract it's not a contract an agreement is unlawful it is of such a nature that if permitted it would defeat the provisions of any law here in the simplest of example you can understand is that see if there is a situation wherein say a uh, certain so, so it's it's like it's regarding some uh, post some recruitment some vacancy some qualifications are li listed right some requirements have been stated requirements are stated now here consider that you give that particular job just to make you understand i'm giving this example but you give a job to a person who is not meeting that criteria right who no, he was not meeting that criteria you enter into a contract with that person you try to enter into a contract with that person but giving that person that job keeping the mind keeping this thing in mind that you already there is already a stated criteria under which that job can be given so you need to possess all this criteria right it is of such a nature if permitted it would defeat the provisions of law so it would defeat the mere the, the very requirement of those uh, desired qualifications if you end up giving that uh, contract to someone recruiting someone who is not fulfilling the criteria what is the point in having that criteria if you are not following it so it's similar thing here then it says is fraudulent in nature now fraudulent for example there are three parties who enter into an agreement with each other saying that see we will commit a fraud against such and such person and whatever amount whatever money we are able to gain from uh, committing that particular fraud we will divide that particular amount between three of us now that is fraudulent in nature that kind of promise being made to each other that is not lawful right so so if uh, say for example one person gets the entire amount and he refuses to share with the other two the other two cannot approach the court of law saying that we had entered into this agreement and he has uh, now committed a breach court will say it was an agreement it was never a contract right in fact here on this point on this juncture i would like to make this uh, point that it is it is a very common saying in the in law and specifically in relation to court of law that a person who is approaching the court person who goes to court for claiming relief has to go with clean hands so you have entered into this agreement wherein you have promised to each other that in this manner we'll go, we'll go and commit a fraud against the other person and then distribute the entire amount between us so then uh, and when you do when you are not getting that share of yours you are approaching the court court will say have you come with clean hand you yourself are the wrong doers right then it says it involves or implies injury to the person or property of another so when we say lawful consideration lawful object it it we are not saying i mean it's not necessary to give the example of sharp shooter always that is causing bodily harm even causing harm to the property injury here means you are trying to cause injury or harm to the property of any person right that is aapko i mean you 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 got that particular say 
what to repair right there was a contract between the two parties that fine you repair this watch for me i'll collect it from tomorrow and in return you said fine i'll repair the watch but tomorrow when you come this is the particular amount which i'll be charging from you right now here consider a situation that the other person has come tomorrow i'm not talking about the criminal point of view we are studying it from the civil point of view so now when that person comes to you tomorrow you refuse to part with that watch of his right so that is injury to the property of that person right you are causing injury to the property of that person or say for example i mean i would like to modify i think i skipped on that point i uh, uh, injury the the agreement the promise which you are making to the person is in relation to injury uh, to the property of another right so i gave this example of this uh, watch which you have given for repair now you've given the watch for repair and uh, here the person says fine uh, there's no need to repair the watch let me keep the watch and uh, there's nothing in this watch it's just gone and i'll keep it in fact to make your claim look more authentic you end up slightly destroying that slightly causing uh, damage to that particular watch right the person insists no it is still workable i would like to use this watch but what you have done you have caused injure injury to his property right the court regards it as immoral or opposed to public policy here at this juncture i would like to highlight two examples when we say immoral there is one example one illustration which is given under section 23 of the indian contract act that is a who is a father lets his daughter to be for concubine age concubine means a keep so he is giving his daughter to b as a concubine so that b can keep uh, the daughter of a as his keep right it's immoral so he has promised to give the daughter in concubine age and the other person has promised to give money that's immoral in nature because immoral reason being that it is not specifically punished under the indian penal code there is no specific punishment given under the indian penal code for that now say uh, it is opposed to public policy now public policy is a term which generally means that uh, it is of uh, it is affecting masses it is affecting public at large right some policy which is in interest of the others or which affects the interest of others right so when we say opposing to opposed to public policy the example which i would like to give here is that there are so many competitive exams and people do compete to get that particular post right and now say one of the persons here one of the parties here promises to give a particular amount of money to the other person in order to purchase that seat without uh, clearing the exam or failing in the exam or whatever the situation be he is basically purchasing that particular seat and is ready to pay a part an amount for it right so can such a contract be valid in the eyes of law is it lawful wherein one person says fine i'll take this much money and you are saying okay fine i'll give this much money and the seat is mine and uh, it should not be given to anybody else right so this is opposed to public policy because public at large everyone is not getting an equal chance to compete here because what you did you so you have actually sold that one seat to the other person and that is incorrect in the eyes of law and it is opposed to public policy because it is affecting the interest of public now one of the most important aspects which i would like to cover here in this uh, topic of exceptions to consideration now there are three fold exceptions to consideration and as we can see see till now we have again and again discussed that see section 10 says these are the essential requirements of a valid contract but what will be the fate of uh, an agreement which is not fulfilling or you can say contract in different situation what what will be the fate if any of such particular uh, condition is not fulfilled 
So, say for example, there is absence of consideration. What will happen? What will you term that agreement wherein consideration is not provided? Right? Agreement without consideration is void. The provision starts with mentioning this thing. That an agreement without consideration is void in nature. Void means it has no value in the eyes of law. Unless it is in writing and registered or is a promise to compensate for something done or is a promise to pay a debt barred by limitation law. Right. Let us see what the provision says in detail now. This is section 25. Section 25 of the Indian Contract Act. Section 25 of the Indian Contract Act provides exceptions to the otherwise uh, important requirement that is there is a requirement of bilateral consideration that is both the parties are providing something to the other party in return of their promise. Right. So, that is I am selling something to you. So, you are paying for that thing to me. Right. Now, when we say agreement without consideration is void, we are trying to say that it is a nudum pactum, it is a bare promise, maybe it is a one sided promise or unilateral promise. So, that is why it is of no value in the eyes of law. It cannot be enforced as a contract in the court of law, right? Unless these, unless there is in existence any of these three instances mentioned. Let us see what these instances are or what these exceptions are. To start with first, it deals with gift. Gift we know, one person makes the gift to the other person. It is not necessary that the other person would be giving something in return. If someone has given a gift to me, I am not under an obligation. I may feel morally obligated that I should also do something for that person, but I am under no legal compulsion or no legal obligation to actually return uh, something to that person for that gift which has been given to me. Now, first exception under section 25 is dealing with a gift made out of natural love and affection. So, if one person has given a gift to another person out of natural love and affection and fulfilling the conditions mentioned under subsection 1 of section 25, it can be a valid contract. It says it is expressed in writing that means that gift has to be in writing form and registered under the law for timing in force. In India, we do have a registration act which tells about the procedure and the requirements for registering of legal documents, right. So, it says if, if you want to or if you wish to treat a gift as, uh, as a part of the contract or as a valid contract, then these conditions have to be fulfilled. It has to be in writing, that gift has to be made in writing, it has to be registered under the registration act and is made on account of natural love and affection and it is to be between the parties standing in a near relation to each other, not a person who is just uh, crossing the road, not a passer by, not a stranger. It says four things, it has to be in writing, gift has to be in writing, it has to be registered, then it says it has to be made out of natural love and affection you have that natural love and affection to, uh, towards someone and you are willing to do something for that person, gift something to that person, right. And the fourth thing is that the gift is to be made to someone who stands in near relation to you, who is related to you, right. And coming to the second subsection now. So, first we, first subsection we just studied that it deals with gift made out of natural love and affection. Then the second subsection is dealing with what we call past voluntary services. You need to distinguish uh, past voluntary services from past consideration, right. You need to understand that there is a difference between past consideration and past voluntary services. Let us see what the difference between the two is. 
past consideration we just studied we just read that past consideration means something which has already been done and now uh, later on you are uh, you are providing consideration for that right so something has already been done consideration from one party has already been provided to you and now you are fulfilling your part of the obligation now let's see what past voluntary services and how is it different from past consideration it says past voluntary services it is a promise to compensate wholly or in part a person who has already voluntarily remember the definition of consideration starts with at the desire of the promiser you have done something for that person now here we are saying that this person has done something voluntarily without uh, without being asked to act in a particular manner out of gratitude you can say that person has done something for the promiser or something which the promiser was legally compelable to do now when we say past voluntary service means say for example i found someone's uh, purse or someone's wallet lying in a particular room right or lying somewhere on the road and i was able to identify to whom it belonged and i quickly went to that person or i made an effort of and found out the details of that person and contacted that person and returned that uh, wallet or that purse to that person after getting that person before i proceed ahead that person did not ask me to look for that purse to go out and search for that purse it is not lalman shukla versus gauri dat wherein the servant of that person has uh, under a duty under a legal obligation had gone out in search of that missing nephew of his employer right here what we are saying past voluntary service means you did something for somebody voluntarily out of your own free will you felt like doing that and you did that for that person now if you have done that later on when i return that purse to that person that person out of gratitude he promises now that he will be because i did this for that person so now that person promises that i'll pay uh, for 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 your kind act kind gesture i promise to pay say 10000 rupees to you right what happens if he later commits a default in doing that now past voluntary services says past voluntary service done and you have promised that person that you will be compensating that person for that past voluntary service you are under obligation now that person can take you to the court because it is an exception to consideration right promise to compensate wholly or in part a person who has already voluntarily done something for the promiser or something which promiser was legally compelable to do so this is the difference between past consideration and past voluntary service past consideration at the desire of the promiser you acted you had acted in a particular manner previously and now he does something for you past voluntary service a person out of his own free will uh, voluntarily did something for you and now later on you promised that i will be suitably compensating you for that gesture so if you have if you have promised to compensate for that gesture you are under a legal obligation now that is what the subsection 2 or the exception 2 to section 25 highlights now the third exception or the last exception to consideration under to the requirement mandatory requirement of consideration under section 25 it is dealing with what we call as time barred debt time barred debt it says it is a promise made in writing and signed by the person to be charged therewith or by his agent generally or specially authorized in that behalf to pay wholly or in part a debt of which the creditor might have enforced payment but for the law for the limitation of suits so in order to understand this example this uh, particular exception we first need to understand what is the meaning of limitation in india there is a law known as the limitation act now the purpose of limitation act is to tell you that uh, say for example 
uh, if someone has taken a loan from you and uh, has promised to return that loan to you, everything is in written and commits a default. Now, say for example, now Limitation Act provides a schedule or it provides a list which says if a particular act happens or if a particular wrong has happened, then in that case, limitation period for going to the court and claiming remedy is as follows. So, different time period for different types of acts. Now, here it means, say for example, I took a loan from someone, I committed a default. Now, the limitation act, say for example, says the day the cause of action arose, that is the day that person refused to return that, uh, the day I refused to return that debt to uh, the other party, then in that situation, the limitation period starts running. That is, say, say for example, one year is the limitation period. So, within that one year period, the other person has to approach the court and claim that repayment of the debt. If the person fails to go to the court, then what will happen? If the person fails to go to the court timely, the person may not get the relief. If the person fails to get relief, legal remedy has come to an end. But there also is a rider. The rider is that now say for example, one year had passed uh, and the person, the, the person from whom I had taken that loan, the creditor, he was not able to approach the court. But I thought it's okay, so I again uh, give it in written. Maybe I had taken a lakh of rupees from that person. Now, after expiry of the limitation period, I give give a promise in written stating that I promise to pay you say uh, uh, fifty thousand rupees in lieu of that one lakh debt by such and such date. Now here, now here, say for example, again I again I commit that default despite that I despite that I had promised again, I committed default. Now that person cannot say. Now I cannot say that uh, there was no uh, there was uh, no promise from your side there was only one sided consideration no not at all it's a time barred debt even if one sided consideration but section the subsection 3 to section 25 makes it to be a good consideration and a valid contract that is if i am later on giving it in writing in promise i am promising that i am i agree or i promise to repay that time barred debt I am under an obligation. The only difference will be that uh, now if I commit default, I can only be asked by the court to give that 50,000 rupees which I had promised at a later stage and not that 1 lakh which had been promised initially. right? Now, there are two exceptions to this uh, particular section 25, two explanations, sorry. The purpose of the explanation is only to provide further clarity to the operational part of any provision. So, the two the explanations are as follows. First is, nothing in this section shall affect the validity as between the donor and donee of any gift actually made. This is dealing with first subsection. The next explanation states, an agreement to which the consent of the promiser is freely given is not void merely because of consideration is inadequate. I had just told you in the beginning of this presentation that although consideration, lawful consideration is a valid requirement of, is, is an important requirement of a valid contract, but consideration need not be adequate, right. With this, I, uh, I finish this session. Thank you all.